Welcome to Hard Talk. I'm Stephen Sacker. Professional football has a problem with homophobia. There are gay footballers, but almost to a man, they feel compelled to keep their sexual orientation secret. The exception is my guest today. Robbie Rogers is a US international who plays for LA Galaxy. He broke football's great taboo by very publicly coming out after a spell in English football. Why haven't other gay footballers followed his lead? Robbie Rogers, welcome to Hard Talk. Thanks. I want to begin with a very broad question. How different a person do you feel yourself to be today, two years or so after having come out, from the guy who as a young man felt compelled to keep this secret for so long? Yeah, uh, c completely different, you know, short answer. Um, I was very depressed, isolated, and, and out of touch with my emotions. And you know, winning a championship in 2008 with the, the Columbus Crew, I could enjoy it, but not really uh, fully, I guess, like seize the moment. And when we won, you know, a few weeks ago with LA Galaxy, I was you know, brought to tears and sharing with my family. And after the game, went to go celebrate with my teammates. And um, I don't know, I, I, I just a totally different person. You've talked about, in a sense, being afraid for so much of your life. Yeah before you came out. And I just wonder, what, what was the basis of that fear? What were you frightened of? I think it was a, a combination. Uh, come from a very conservative Catholic family where you grow up thinking that like, being gay is not a good thing. And then I also grew up in, in the sports world where you know, on a daily basis you hear different homophobic things, words being used. And, and uh, you know, I, I, there's banter and I'm fine with that, but then it gets to a point where it's like just goes too far. So. I was afraid and, and kind of scarred as a youth to think that uh, if I ever accepted that side of myself, if I ever shared that side of myself, that I would be um, uh, almost like disowned. So if we think about Robbie Rogers, the, the kid, and, and yeah. you were a, a sort of standout footballer at, yeah. at school, and I guess by junior high and high school it was clear yeah. that you had a pretty special talent. Yeah. Were you saying to yourself, you know, I, I'm a real star athlete, but as a result of that, even if I'm beginning to feel I might have a sexual orientation which is homosexual yeah. rather than heterosexual, I've got to keep a lid on that. Yeah. You know, was that the way you were beginning to think? Yeah, it was when I was around 13, 14 that I realized, like I was playing for the youth national teams and realized like, oh, this is what I, what I want to do. And I'd start watching Arsenal play and different mm -hmm. players. And, and um, you know, so I realized that there were no gay athletes out there. There was no one for me to look up to. There was, uh, you know, it was a very macho sport of, you know, heterosexual men. So I thought that's what I had to be. And when I realized I was gay, I was like, well, I can't do this. <laughs> you, you literally said to yourself, like, I've got to make a choice here. If yeah. I want to pursue the football yeah. and try and make it a career, yeah. I am going to have to suppress my real identity. Yeah, yeah, there was that side. And then there was also, again, my, my family that I was worried about. So it was like the perfect combination just to create this, uh, I don't know, just to keep me closet mm. for a long time. So leaving aside football altogether, the, there was no way you felt you could tell your family at the no, time? No, no, definitely not. Because they would have... Yeah, like, I mean, the kind of discussions that were going on in my house were, you know, let's say if same-sex marriage came up, you know, in California. Um, they would be totally against that. They were. Now it's totally different. Now that, you know, they had the personal experience and have me in their life, they can't wait till I get married. Hmm. But back in the day, they, you know, would talk about that in the house, and I knew that they weren't supportive of it, so... Uh, you know, obviously I felt like I was in an environment where I could be gay. You've written a lot about your uh, upbringing and your youth in, in your memoir, Coming Out to Play, and I just wonder if it's been hard for your family to read some of the stuff, particularly the way in which you felt you couldn't confide yeah. in them and be open with your yeah. own mother and father and siblings yeah. for so many years. Yeah, I mean, they've all said to me they were, they're really sad and, um, and they just, they wanted to be able to help me through those times, you know, and, and they're sad that I felt like I couldn't tell them and I couldn't share that with them. Because that's the last thing you want in the world is for your kid to go through something so depressing, you know, by themselves. So, 
um, you know, I've heard from everyone in my family that, that, that they wish and that I wish that I could have felt comfortable in doing that. Mm. It, your career went off very well. I mean, you, you joined Columbus Crew, I think, at the time, one of the best MLS yeah. uh, US Soccer League teams. I think in 2008, when you were still a very young man, yeah, you 21. won the MLS Cup. Yeah. It is interesting, and you've reflected on this a little bit already in this interview, that even though you were having great times, and even though football is such a team sport, you felt a bit like yeah. an outsider. And that's kind of what made me come out eventually. I was going through these moments that I dreamed of, going to the Olympics, having my first cap for the national team, winning a championship and all that stuff, and I wasn't happy, and I was so depressed, and I'd go home thinking like, like why, why am I not happy? Like I thought that this was gonna kind of mask that, that uh, that homophobia that I almost had towards myself, you know, I thought that was going to mask this stuff, this depression. And um, it's an interesting phrase you just yeah. used. Was there a point, even in your late teens and early twenties, where you still tried to convince yourself you might not be gay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like dated girls and thought that I might. <laughs> it's crazy when I look back at it, but I thought that you know, maybe I'd meet the right girl that would like change me somehow. I mean, it's absolutely insane looking at my letters, my diaries, and, and seeing things that I sent to people. But um, you know, I was just. You know, I didn't share that with anyone, so I had all these weird internal mm. thoughts and thoughts that uh, somehow I could change myself or somehow um, I could just live this life of, of being uh, very internal with all my emotions, all right. um, which is dangerous. I mean, a lot of kids uh, that I hear from um, you know, become suicidal or, you know, have uh, lives that are just very depressing because they're so afraid to share, you know, who they are. Well, you talk about suicidal. I'm, yeah. It makes me mindful of an interview I did not so long ago with the Welsh rugby star player, yeah. Gareth Thomas, who was a hero in Wales. Yeah. And it's a pretty macho game, as you know. Yeah. Um, he was gay. He knew he was gay. Yeah. But for a long time, he couldn't come out, even to his family. Yeah. Uh, certainly couldn't come out while he was still playing. He did afterwards. But he said to me in the studio, he said there were points where he was so low. Yeah. He felt suicidal. Yeah. I mean, how low? Yeah, at when, your worst. Yeah, and I read about it in the book. But uh, when I was living in Holland, when I first turned pro, that was like my moment where I was just like, you know, it might not, it might be easier just not to be alive. And I mean, it was an awful thing to like think and and to let you know mm -hmm. go through your mind. Um, but I was just so depressed and and thought it was just never gonna be possible again for me to to come out. So um, I know how he feels. Let's talk about um, homophobia, because. Hmm. Frankly, there's no other word for it. Yeah. In, in football, there is still a culture which, you know, some, in, in the mildest uh, way of putting it, might call a lad culture, but others would just say is out and out homophobic. Yeah. And, and you have had to, for years, watch that yeah. and be in the midst of it yeah, and yeah. be completely silent about your own sexual yeah. identity. Yeah, I mean, I think there's, you know, there's banter, which you know you're not too sensitive to and, and you know it flies around and whatever it's always gonna be part of the sports culture but then there's a, a point where it gets past that where uh you know it's there's like a malicious tone to it where uh and i've spoken about this but where guys will like have a discussion i've been in a locker room where guys have a discussion like how could you even be gay how could you go through the act of loving them like how disgusting is that and i'd be riding the bike there and i'd be like oh my gosh like i'm never coming out this is impossible or i am but i'm definitely not going to be in this locker room so there's definitely uh you what know about that, coaches as well because yeah same I just, oh same I, i've heard coaches say things like don't pass the ball like a faggot it's like well, what does that mean like you know i'm passing a ball now like everyone else and i'm gay so <laughs> Um, but, but that's I mean, were, were you, if you were in a training session yeah. and uh, if you literally heard yeah. a coach say don't pass like a faggot yeah were you ever tempted to march up to that coach <laughs> and say do you want to know something yeah uh, no I mean there were there were late like in the end towards more of the end of my career I remember I heard it once and like I actually left and after training and like laughed about it because I was like how insane that this person would say something and like believe that and think that it was acceptable to do that uh and i was out with one of my buddies then so i was talking to them and i was like I, it's hard for me not to like just see how ridiculous it is mm. um so you know when i was younger and i heard things like that i would just go internal and just be you know more depressed i guess and keep that stuff inside which again is so dangerous for people in in your book you've used that phrase which is a very powerful phrase you've talked about a pack mentality yeah. in in a, in a male yeah I mean, obviously, there are many females play soccer, yeah, but if we're yeah. talking about, you know, elite level yeah. professional male soccer. The pack mentality is as 
pretty much as strong today, despite all of the talk about yeah. removing discrimination yeah. from the game. It's as strong today as it ever was. Yeah, uh, it's a little different now, I think. I think people are more sensitive to things. I know the Galaxy, it's, it's different. But yeah, that pack mentality where guys say things to make guys laugh, they say things because they think they're supposed to say them, that they're supposed to all agree on things, you know, they don't want to stand out too much. Um, you know, that is something that I don't quite understand. Um, you know, obviously I'm a person that like kind of goes a different way and I did definitely when I turned 25, but even before then, I've always been a person I think that uh, not necessarily you know, always wanted to stand out, but I'm not afraid to disagree with people. Mm. And for whatever reason, I think, maybe it's not just in sports, but it's just people in general, just um, become part of that mentality and that pack mentality. I say that they want to live up to stereotypes. They want to um, say things to have people agree with them. And, and I learned that because, you know, I noticed after I came out, the same guys that were very homophobic before I came out, well, the same guys that were supporting me and be like, oh, I hope I didn't say anything in the locker rooms that, so that scared you or hurt you and you shouldn't retire, you know, you should keep playing. And so it's not that they're homophobic, it's just, again, that they're part of that like mentality. It's a culture. It's a culture, An exactly. unthinking sort of culture. Exactly, exactly. Well, let, let's continue the sort of, uh, the arc of your career because the, 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 the last sort of stop in your career before you decided to come yeah. out publicly was, was actually in the UK, it was yeah. in England in, at Leeds United. Yeah. A very famous yeah. historic club, um, but a club that has a reputation for being tough. Yeah, that was a tough club, yeah. A, a macho sort of culture yeah. where Definitely. many other clubs and fans in the UK don't like them very much, but yeah. they don't care. Yeah. Uh, it just seems to me the epitome of the sort of club that probably you would find it difficult to handle. Was that part of you being pushed over the edge and deciding, you know what, I can't handle this anymore? No, it wasn't. And actually, uh, Leeds fans have been extremely supportive. Uh, I wasn't expecting that either way. I didn't know if I'd hear from any of them. But um, uh, Leeds was the same as every other club for me in terms of hearing homophobic things and hearing things in the locker room, all that stuff, you know. Uh, every day you pretty much would hear something that was homophobic in the locker room and that's just how my life was before I came out. But uh, after I came out, those were the same guys again that supported me, you know, coaches that supported me, um, the organization, everything. And I went back to Leeds last year and did something with the charity and, and you know, I had a standing ovation at the, at the stadium at Ellen Road. So, um, you know, I was, again, surprised to learn that, you know, again, these guys aren't, these fans are not necessarily homophobic and that they are part of that, uh, that culture, that mentality. So let's get to the point where you do decide to come out. Yeah. Uh, you're age 25 and you've had a huge number of injuries, so your career is stalled yeah. anyway, yeah. really. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't going well at Leeds. Yeah. Um, there's just one thing I want to put to you, and I wonder if this was in your mind. Perhaps the only very well-known elite level player in the UK before yourself who came out was yeah. a guy called Justin Fashionu, yeah. who, who uh, was a gay player in the 80s, mm -hmm. seven, late 70s and 80s. He had a terrible time when it became yeah. known he was gay. He didn't yeah. so much publicly come out, but it became known. Yeah. And his very famous manager coach at Nottingham Forest, Brian Clough, ridiculed him yeah, and humiliated him yeah. in public. And, and his career was never the same again. Yeah. You took the decision not just to come out, but to announce your retirement at the same time. Yeah. Was it because you were mindful of the history of someone like Justin Fashionu? I mean, that was that was part of it, um, but more so it was uh, putting myself back in an environment that was extremely homophobic. Like I thought, there's no way that I'm, now that I'm out to put myself back into that environment. Like you have to be crazy <laughs> to do that. Or that so least, you that's still what thought I felt. you cannot that's be a, thought, an active thought, gay player. I thought when I came out that I was done with football. And that's why, again, I went back to school. But it wasn't until after the reaction that I received from, from thousands and thousands of letters and just heard from so many people that I realized, like, you know, I got to at least, like, go back and train with the Galaxy and just see what that would be like. Um, so, yeah, it was, you know, a combination of, of his story and, and not having any role models to look up to that have done it and uh, the amount of things I heard in the locker room. It was, like, you know, the combo of all those things that made me think it wasn't possible. Right. I mean, the law of averages and also anecdotal evidence suggests that there are quite a number yeah. of gay professional footballers. Yeah. You are the one who had the courage to come out a couple of years ago. But when you did, and since you did, have others approached you and talked to you about their yeah, situation? Yeah. Everyone, everyone asks me that question, <laughs> and it's always like, I don't have a great answer for you. I, I've heard from you know, NFL players, NBA players, uh, a number of athletes. You know that are closeted or mm. 
are dealing with this kind of stuff. But I haven't heard from one footballer. Not one. Not one. Which is just absolutely the, reminds the, me of the atmosphere. Yeah, it, it's extraordinary because the PFA chief, the head of the Professional yeah. Players Union in, in England, Gordon Taylor, has said that, you know, there are players. He yeah. knows oh, who yeah, for are, sure they who've are. discussed with him the fact that they yeah. still feel they cannot come yeah. out. I mean, what, what yeah. is your message to those players, having yeah. done it and having decided to quit, but then put your foot back into the professional football yeah. waters and found it okay and now having a successful second career in LA. Yeah. I mean, just message? for me, I can just talk about my experience and how much support I've had and again, then being able to like enjoy work and going to the, the training ground every day and, and enjoying, you know, traveling with my teammates, uh, you know, stuff that I couldn't do before when I was so closeted and so afraid to like show who I was. So, you know, I think just my experience is the message, you know, and, and, um, but it's interesting because you said, uh, at the time of, of quitting, yeah. you said, you know, what I don't want to be is, is the sort of token gay yeah, footballer. Yeah. And you said, I do not want to be the guy who after a game is asked the stupid questions about what's it like yeah. in the locker room and other guys happy to shower with you and yep. all that stuff. And you, I, you said, don't, I don't want that. that. I didn't want that. <laughs> you know, again, that's another reason why I wanted to retire, but, um, I, I realized how much of a coward I would be. I, I went back to the States and, and I was speaking with like this Nike and this organization called Glisten and the kids at the end of the, of the conference were like, all right, Robbie, I'm gonna go home tomorrow. Like what kind of difference can I make? Uh, I'm part of my GSA, which is like Gay Straight Alliance in high school. And they like, you know, run their organizations. Like what kind of stuff can I be doing? And I was supposed to go there helping these kids. And I realized like, I mean, any of these kids would just like love to have the platform that I have. Mm -hmm. All I have to do is go back on a soccer field. So it took me, you know, four months after I retired to realize that, like, I just have to go back on a soccer field, do something that I love and like sack up and just like, you know, play. Um, and it wasn't ever my intention to do this. It wasn't ever my intention. I mean, I'd be lying if I said I wanted to help, you know, thousands of kids. Like, it wasn't my intention. Mm -hmm. I just I just want to come out and be happy. But, uh, you know, I'm very lucky to be able to help people by doing that. So but, uh, and you've had a successful season. Yeah. The last season uh, in the MLS yeah. you know, with the Galaxy and you won the cup and yeah. it's all going great. But do you still feel there is a sort of. Uh, a metaphorical label over your head every time you run out onto the field. I don't. I, no, I don't think about it, and I don't think the, the fans in LA do either. I think they care if we're going to win a championship <laughs> or not, you know, and how the game's going. Last year, I did. Last year, I was very aware of it. I was aware that I was the only gay one in the locker room. I was aware of, um, you know, having to relate we got, relate with people. Um, but that got over quickly, and, and you know, the transition has been pretty normal, very smooth. So I actually never think about it when I'm going to work anymore. What? Not so long ago, we interviewed uh, the famous, successful gay actor, Rupert Everett. Uh, he's had loads of parts in movies, been yeah. successful on stage. But he says, controversially, he still says, if I am advising a young actor today who is gay yeah. and on the cusp of making a decision about whether to come out or not, my advice might be don't because it's going to restrict the number of roles you get mm -hmm. the types of roles you get and if you want to be an a-lister and you want the, yeah. the, the the big career think very carefully yeah. before coming out what would your yeah. advice be to the young footballer who might be you know equivalent yeah. to robbie rogers age 16 deciding what to yeah. do i mean if i had the courage as a youngster to come out and just be you know an amazing role model for people and and uh to be ext like extremely talented, um, there's tons of them out there. I mean, I would love for that opportunity now, you know, just because I would see what kind of difference I was making and, and uh, just being really myself and enjoying, you know, every obstacle as it came and enjoying the moment. Um, yeah, I th I th I, it would be interesting to go back in time now and see if I would have the same opportunities. But if you're a good footballer in today's age, I think that you're a good footballer and that people won't care. And you say that despite the fact that there is evidence at the top of football, institutional sort yeah. of evidence, that the game hasn't changed that much. I'm thinking, for example, well, I, of FIFA, who've yeah. decided to give the World Cup in 2022 to, to Qatar, which is a country where homosexual, homosexuality yeah. is still a crime. Yeah, I can, again, I, I understand that it actually makes me really mad. I don't understand a lot of stuff that FIFA does. But, um, you know, I play for the LA Galaxy. I'm an openly gay man. And, um, you know, I might get back to the national team. and people have been very accepting to me. So I can only speak from my experiences. I know that, uh, you know, there's, you know, high levels of FIFA that are uh, almost thoughtless in their decision-making, but um, 
you know, they the only change is going to come, or change is only going to come if, if players decide to just be themselves and play. So, I mean, you're being very generous when you say it's just thoughtless. You could argue, if you listen to Seth Blatter, for example, yeah. when he was asked about this issue of yeah. Qatar and the yeah. criminalization of, of homosexuality, he said, well, you know what, if you're a gay fan thinking of going to Qatar, maybe best just refrain from yeah. any sexual activity with, yeah. a, with a chuckle. I mean, what, you know, I know, is I know. that just thoughtless or is that no, symptomatic I, I, of an I, attitude I, problem? Yeah, it's definitely an attitude problem. And I know people have asked him not to run again. and. Um, you know, I think that it's a little bit insane that someone like that is is in charge of such a huge organization. But I think FIFA has bigger. I mean, has a lot of problems with racism, sexism. The Women's World Cup is going to be on artificial turf. Mm. Like, can you ever imagine them doing that to the men? Like never in a million years. Homophobia, obviously. And uh, but then, how? Wh where do you decide? To, to sort of suck it up and not, not, not to engage and not to try yeah. to change attitudes. For example, you know, you know better than I that yeah. in the, in the fo average football ground in, the, in England, yeah. uh, you hear chants which are disgustingly homophobic, yeah. you know, yeah. aimed at players from the opposition whom they don't like. Yeah. Whether the guy, it's yeah, yeah. irrelevant, the sexuality of the player, yeah. it's just a way to wind people up. It was yeah. pure homophobia. Yeah. Shouldn't the police be patrolling that and, and uh, prosecuting people for that sort yeah, of thing? I think FIFA needs to have rules across the board about any kind of discrimination. You know, that needs to be an obvious one. Uh, to go back to your initial point, um, I think that, I don't know, I think FIFA has so much power to do, you know, so much good, but um, it really comes down to like me being present. Me going to a World Cup where maybe it's in Russia or somewhere where I would be in trouble for being gay. But if I'm present and active and, and, and honest about who I am. I've learned from my experience that, you know, being open with people and being honest with people changes their minds so quickly. And of course, there's going to be tons of people that are going to hate me. And there's a fine balance between like boycotting or being an activist. And I choose to be an activist. I choose to be there and be playing and to be a light on the field for other gay people in the crowd that are closeted. And uh, I would risk that just because I know that it makes a bigger difference. I mean, you've raised an interesting point because, uh, as you know, World Cup 2018 is in Russia. We all know what Vladimir Putin's stance is on homosexuality. And you, yeah. given your form right now, yeah. stand a fighting chance of being in the US yeah. national team yeah. by then. Yeah. How would you feel about playing in Russia? Yeah, that's a good question. People ask me about the Olympics. And first off, it's crazy that these countries are hosting. You know, it should have it should be changed if there's time it should have not yeah, been allowed it, to them it's probably not but it's not happen. going to so yeah. the question so, for robbie rogers is so the, are you prepared to yeah. go there to so, Russia so, or to so for the olympics i would have gone to the olympics i would have been an out athlete i would have worn a symbol i would have been like overly lgbt active and because there are a number of people that live in those countries that are just I mean, it's so sad for them. They're beaten, they're stoned, they're persecuted for being just who they are, for being gay, for how they were created. So I would go to those countries and be myself and be active because I think, again, that's the only way to change things. By not going, it's still going to go on. So by not going, you're brushing it under the rug and that's it. You know, so I would be there. I would 100% I would be there and I would encourage others to be there and be active. Unless, of course, we can start the dialogue now to move it. But that's not going to happen. Final thought. Yeah. You have been blessed with a great athletic talent. It's made you a great footballer. Given all of the travails and difficulties and challenges you've had in your sporting life, do you ever wish that your talent had lain elsewhere, <laughs> that you'd been blessed yeah. with a different sort of talent, where yeah. being gay might have been a much easier proposition? I've, I've said to my mom a number of times and my friends, like, um, it's weird, God gave me this talent, but I don't think he gave me this mind to be a footballer. <laughs> I think he, maybe, if I could have used these in some different way, some other creative world where it would be easier. But, I mean, I'm a, I get to change, especially the younger generation's mind about this stuff. I get to encourage uh, people that struggled with the same stuff that I struggled with to, to continue to pursue their dreams. So, um, you know, I, I, I love what I'm doing, and I love, uh, it's been a tough road, but, um, you know, I'm happy where I am at now, so yeah, I don't regret it. It's a good place to end. Robbie Rogers, <laughs> thanks, thanks for being on. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much.